I'm leaving, was what I cried. In response, my wife said, good, and don't come back. I was trying to be kind tonight, but normally I would have screamed something indignant as I hurried out the door. We have had the same conversation several times during the 14 years of our marriage. But I always came back. Ignore it. She would realize that I was serious this time in a matter of days. For the last six or seven months, my wife, Jenna, had been verbally abusive to me. To me, it was all a mystery. Her remarks were, to put it mildly, scathingly impolite. In the hopes that it wouldn't become worse, I started to ignore her as much as possible. I started spending more and more time at the car dealership every day. We would frequently return home late, even after our daughter Jenna and our 13-year-old daughter Carrie had finished their dinner. They would leave me on my own. Occasionally, there were traces. Recently, though, I swear they were thrown in the trash before I even got home. You can call me Kurt Kaminsky. Since my dad is also named David, people have always called me Kurt, even though my full name is David Kurt Kaminsky. I'm not a junior, sorry. My father's name is Dave John Kaminsky. Why he didn't just elevate me to junior is beyond me. No, I would have loved to be called Kurt or DK, but I chose Kurt because I didn't like the way DK was pronounced. Yes, I have Polish ancestors, but I was born in America. I've heard all the jokes. I don't think it's all of them, though. It seems like they create brand new ones every year. In addition to the subtle ones, I've heard some pretty nasty ones like, do you know why Polish and Polish are spelled the same? Because they don't know the difference between garbage and shoe polish. Do you know why Polacks spell their name with ski at the end? Because they don't know how to spell toboggan. There have been worse things said, but I won't get into that here. Since I am the only person of Polish descent in this town of about 10,000 people apart from my dad, I was ridiculed by many. In addition to my mother's side of the family's German, French, Irish, and English background, I also have Polish ancestry. However, my last name, Kaminsky, indicates that I am of Polish ancestry. But I'm veering off subject. Going back to the subject at hand, the person I thought my soon-to-be ex-wife was is not who she is. I only found out about this four weeks ago. As I indicated before, I was spending more and more time away from my wife due to her hostile behavior. After coming home hungry several times, I made the decision to go out to eat one Monday night. As I prepared to place my order, I saw two men conversing at a different booth across the room. The sentence that included the word Polak caught my attention in particular. According to my enhanced listening abilities, one of the men inquired, So you've been with the Polak's wife for how long? Since before they were married. In fact, I was with her on their wedding day, and he was clueless. She had to have my presence lingering as she walked down the aisle. I didn't recognize the first man's voice, but I recognized the second. It was my best friend George Carey. I sat there dumbfounded. George continued, but I didn't hear anything more. Yeah, we get together at least twice a month. Kurt is so busy at the car a lot that he doesn't even know what's happening. Again, clueless. Sorry, I gotta go. I said in a whisper as the waitress was about to take my order, and then I left discreetly, moving away from their booth in the hopes that they wouldn't notice. I was amazed. Jenna, my wife and greatest friend, he had even been the best man at my wedding. In addition, he has been and will remain my mechanic. He performs all of my auto repairs and inspections, but he isn't really my mechanic because he is an independent contractor. I have a large collection of used cars, as you are undoubtedly already aware. Yes, I do sell used automobiles. I've heard all those jokes and insults, just like you. On the other hand, my company is doing quite well. Everyone is aware that they may purchase an excellent car for a fair price. I also have a reputation for standing by my cars. I am the one who handles problems. George has always been capable mechanically, and I keep him busy and pay him well. I was seriously considering hiring him, but I could see he meant it when he said he wouldn't respect himself if he had a Polak for a boss. I nevertheless hired him as an independent contractor mechanic because I thought he was one, but he was not independent. To be honest, Without me, he would not have been able to support himself. He would die as a result of that truth. I got into my car and drove about after I finished my lunch. I wondered, could this really be happening, or was he merely exaggerating? If he was right, they meant no more than twice a month, but I could afford a private investigator. That may prove to be very expensive. However, I could review her phone logs and communications. That was my choice. 
Jenna was being her usual grumpy self when I arrived home. I was okay with that because I wanted to keep away from her until I found out. She fell asleep on her side of the bed, and I got up to check her email. No unusual activity was found upon closer examination. I was able to swiftly figure out our daughter's password-protected phone's combination, which was her birth date. Although I could see a number of texts that may be misread, none of them were from or addressed to George. It wasn't shocking to see his name in her contact list because he was my best friend. I thought, maybe he was just talking out of his ass. However, her recent behavior made me question whether she was ill. Maybe not with George, but with someone else. After getting into bed, I had trouble falling asleep. Since that was the time on the clock when I last checked, it arrived after 2.43 in the morning. George made a Polish joke when he visited the car lot the next day. This was normal for him. I usually stifled a little chuckle and ignored it when it occurred. However, today was the day I got it. George, what do you even know about Poland? I bet if I laid out a map of the world, you couldn't even point to it. You make jokes like all Polacks are dumb, but I bet they could point out the U.S. on a map and maybe even our state. Why don't you just get to work? George looked at me, his face expressionless. He knew I was right, since if his life depended on it, he couldn't even point to Poland. George was never very intelligent when it comes to books. Despite his good looks, intelligence, and mechanical skills, he was never a good fit for college. I guess it explains why he spent so much time with me during our high school years. I helped him with his assignments so he could pass the course. By now, I was beginning to doubt my choice of friends. He was making me rethink my marriage decision. I closed the door and retreated to my office, where I considered several ways to obtain evidence. There was no point because if I challenged them, they would both just deny it. I needed proof. I got in touch with a private investigator in Santa Fe. He was informed of my concerns. Installing a phone tracker on your wife's phone would allow you to always know where she is, he said, adding that tailgating them would be too expensive considering it only happens about twice a month. Installing home security cameras is another option, but unless you go for the most expensive ones, they'd probably be found. Even with the most expensive ones, unless your wife is completely unaware of her surroundings, she'd probably notice something different. In your position, I'd suggest installing a phone tracker on her phone and hoping to catch them in a motel or something. I got his recommendation for the monitoring program and told him I would be mailing him a check to thank him for all of his assistance. I haven't done anything. You owe me nothing. He said, all the information I gave you could have been obtained off the internet. Say hi at Kaminsky's car dealership the next time you're in Silver City. I should be getting a check shortly because you gave me useful information when I came to you for help. I usually avoid that area of the state, but I will definitely look you up was what he meant when he said it. Making people feel important was a big part of my success selling vehicles. I realized early on how important it is to help others believe in their own worth and the worth of their work. He saved me the hassle, the cost, and the embarrassment of buying cameras that Jenna would undoubtedly notice, and I thought he was right as I looked up at the camera, having studied the tracking software. When everyone had gone to bed that night, I woke up and used the tracking software to connect her phone to mine, which would quietly work in the background without her knowing. I slept better that night. The next day at work, I kept checking the app throughout the day. She was working part-time at the university bookstore, putting in only 15 to 20 hours a week, and she would spend her mad money on anything she wanted, usually a trip to the salon, though when I checked it later, I noticed that she had gone to the grocery store. She eventually went home. Since George came and went during the day, I was certain that nothing had happened on that specific day, but Jenna was at home and he was at work. I decided to be kinder to my family that evening, and I noticed that my wife was more open to my suggestion that they try dinner at Revel Restaurant. While Carrie was acting like the 13-year-old she usually is, unsure if she wants to be photographed with her parents, and she reluctantly went to the car despite my insistence. I had supper, and when I mentioned George in discussion, Jenna gave me a sidelong glance and then immediately changed the topic when she saw that I was staring at her. I wanted to know if George was telling the truth, and I had to figure something out. I didn't check her phone that night, and I couldn't see any of her conversations or messages. Either she wasn't making them, or she was deleting them right away. Thanks for going out to dinner tonight, I expressed as I climbed into bed. Kurt, thank you. It was a welcome surprise. It had been a while, because, as I previously stated, our relationship had been strained lately. 
Jenna came back from the bathroom after completing her nightly preparations, snuggling up beside me in bed. I was torn about the prospect of any intimacy with her. Would I have wanted to if she had cheated? I decided it would be best to let her initiate the conversation and then reply once I had evidence. We did go close, but it was so cliché that it isn't worth going into too much detail. For the rest of the week, I continued to check the location of her phone and found no unusual activity. And on Saturday night after she had gone to bed, I checked it again and found no texts or calls, George trying to impress a guy with stories about his life. And I was on the verge of believing him when I realized he was lying. And I knew from high school that this would not be the only time. I went back to bed and tossed and turned again, but my mind would not let me sleep, so I woke up at 2 in the morning after sitting in bed and staring at the ceiling for hours on end, and then I went downstairs to get a drink, just in case that would help me fall asleep eventually. I sat there with her phone in one hand and a tumbler glass of Jack Daniels and Coke in the other, and I decided to have another look at her phone, entering her password and birth date to access my daughter's homepage. Then I had a huge epiphany. It all came down to the day our daughter was born. We were afraid we might lose her on multiple occasions during her challenging pregnancy, and there was some debate about her RH not being compatible with my wife's. My wife's body seemed to be at odds with her inner child, and she was actually forced to stay in bed for the last three weeks of her pregnancy to make sure the baby would be born healthy. We were ecstatic when she carried us to term and gave birth to Carrie exactly nine months before to our wedding. Although she was medically healthy, she was a big pain in the ass as a baby, fussing all the time, refusing to take regular naps, and even refusing to nurse when Jenna nursed her. It was depressing, but I had to acknowledge that the kid was taking away all of our joy when my wife told me bluntly in Carrie's second year that we will not be having another one. Some couples name their babies wedding night babies after the night of the wedding or the honeymoon when the couple got married. I mentioned it nine months before she was born. In my mind, a switch was flipped. George thought Jenna might have been pregnant before our wedding night, if his claims were true. When asked how Jenna got pregnant, the doctor surmised that the stress of the wedding had made the pill useless because it affected her hormones. If it didn't work that night, it definitely didn't work the next day. The pill had been Jenna's regimen. No, we hadn't postponed having sex until we were married. We spent a good deal of time doing it. The next step became quite evident to me. I might not have been the father half the time. The phrase goes, the early bird gets the worm. In this instance, George might have been the one, but I think it should read, the early worm gets the bird. I woke up and went to the bathroom, found the Q-tips, and went into Carrie's room. She was a good sleeper now, and by the time she was four, she had developed a regular sleep schedule. So far, things have been difficult. She lay there snoring, mouth open, and it was easy to use the Q-tip to swab the inside of her cheek. She was still completely unconscious. Even if it turned out that Carrie was my real kid, I would still mistrust Jenna's faithfulness. But if Carrie wasn't genetically mine, things were going to get ugly. So I wrapped it in a plastic bag and did the same for myself. Sunday was the official work around the house day, and each of us had our own set of chores to complete. So I was cautious with Jenna and Carrie not wanting to give anything away since I couldn't control my emotions. I was intrigued and nervous to see how my assumptions would turn out. And this was one of my main worries all day. Is something upsetting you, Kurt? Jenna asked. I intend to purchase a large number of cars at the upcoming auction in order to fill my lot. But money will be tight until I generate sales to counterbalance that, I said, frantically trying to think of a way to justify it. Well, don't overextend us, she added. She insisted on using the pronoun us whenever we talked about the business, which makes sense considering her ownership stake. However, when I first started the car lot, I had included it to shield myself from personal liability, and I wanted business-related issues to not affect my personal life, particularly since we live in a litigious culture. I said, I think I'm going to pay off the credit cards and cancel all, but one, so that our credit worthiness looks that much better, all part of a complex plot to hide my real goal which was to stop her from taking advantage of me financially after she discovered the truth. In an informal manner, she said, whatever you think you need to do. The concept had come to me on the spur of the moment. It's amazing how your mind can work when you give it the chance. And if my expectations were right, this would lessen the impact. So, after picking up my samples, I went to see a member of the science department at West New Mexico University first thing Monday morning, and they took me to the head of the department, 
who told me that they would be happy to accept my request for a cellular and molecular biology major. I gave him some business cards and said that anyone who helped with the samples would receive a 10% discount. He thanked me and went on, I have been considering trading in my Camry for a newer car. I may need to stop by and look at your selection. If you don't see anything you like, just let me know and I'll work with you to get you something you do like, replied the man. I replied, thank you, I'll do that. I must have smiled as I left the university, but it must have been a troubled grin and it may have been the end of my marriage. I was attempting to hide my nervousness when I told Jenna that I was going to acquire additional cars to fill my lot. I thought, that's not a bad idea. I called Paul, my bookkeeper, loan officer, and occasionally salesman, into my office and told him about my plan. With assurance, he said, we can make it work. I want to do something else too, Paul. I want to pay off my home's mortgage. Can we arrange for me to receive a one-time payment so that I can complete that? Let me take a closer look at the financials and get back with you this afternoon. When he left my office, I thought about calling my lawyer to ask for a family law lawyer referral. You might be jumping the gun, I thought. Let's first watch the outcome. I had yet to find any proof that my wife had cheated on me. That afternoon, Paul gave me the spreadsheet and we discussed how to proceed with my two proposals. The two days were so long that I felt like I was constantly on edge while I awaited the results of the DNA test. Late Wednesday afternoon, I got a call from the department head who was on his way to check out a car and deliver the results. Upon his arrival, I ushered him into my office and based on his expression as he looked at me, I could tell the results right away. He then raised his voice to confirm it, saying, the two samples collected are not related. He could see by the way I dropped my head that the news broke me, even though I had been expecting it, and he gave me a moment to process it before slipping the manila envelope with the results over. So, what kind of car were you thinking about? I inquired, raising an eyebrow and putting on a new expression. I realize this will seem cliche, but I'm searching for a sports car as I recently turned 50. A Mazda Miata was on my mind. I told him that I would not have one on my land, but that I would go to an auction the next day to find one that was in good mechanical and aesthetic condition, and that I would phone him the next afternoon to tell him what I had found. As he left, I told Anna, my receptionist, scheduler, office manager, and part-time salesperson, I will be leaving early, but if you need me, I will only be a phone call away. I suspected she wouldn't call as she hardly ever needed me, and she could do almost everything that needed to be done. I just drove around the town, taking in everything, and I noticed something different, and it's strange. My lawyer was sorry to hear the news, but he suggested another lawyer he believed would represent me fairly, so I called to make an appointment the next afternoon, went out to eat, and thought. I knew that I couldn't pretend to be ignorant, but now that I knew, I couldn't go back. Had the past 15 years of my life been in vain? I couldn't even say that I had a child from the marriage. Yes, I still thought of her as my child, but she wasn't biologically mine. I needed enemies like George, and I didn't care if he had been my best friend for years. I just knew he would pay. I wonder if she knew Carrie wasn't my, but even if she didn't, she had kept this secret from me. Her wedding day in discretion with my best man, my best friend. There was no reason not to accept what I had overheard. She was with him at least twice a month. Jenna was going to pay as well. Hey, Kurt, she replied. I needed to call Jenna and let her know I wouldn't be home that night because I was terrified I would do something that would land me in jail. I needed to get away from everyone and myself before my wrath got the better of me. Try not to seem emotional, I said. Hey, I'm going to spend the night in Albuquerque so I can be ready for the auction at 8 o'clock. Excellent. Excuse me, but... Excellent. She hoped your trip would be safe. I was worried that she may try to take advantage of the fact that I would be gone all night by passing Carrie off to my parents, which would be a tough situation to explain, as I don't usually travel to Albuquerque for an auction. However, I would periodically check her phone tracker throughout the night to see if she decided to travel somewhere else. In order to buy 20 cars, including a Mazda Miata, I traveled up to Albuquerque and planned to have them picked up or returned to my property after the auction. Who would I have mechanically inspect these cars before they were sent down to our little town? Was what was now on my mind. I would have to speak with one of the local dealers at the auction to find someone trustworthy enough to check the cars before they were shipped to our town. But I knew that once George completed his planned car reviews and repairs, he would be able to charge me a pretty penny for all the work he wanted done on them. I would keep that a secret until the very last minute. 
I got to Albuquerque at about 9 in the morning and checked into a Best Western. And even though I was the owner, I couldn't defend charging the company accounts for such an expensive hotel. And the bed and room were fine. And that was all I needed because I am just a simple man with simple needs. I looked at Jenna's phone tracker as soon as I entered and noticed that she was supposedly still at home. As I pondered her behavior and tried to figure out how she could justify spending our wedding day with him, let alone twice a month for an unspecified period of time, the night went by with little sleep. As I started thinking back on our marriage, I saw that it was never perfect. After all, whose is it? But I had foolishly thought that we were totally in love. Our initial plan was to wait three or four years before starting a family, and we had agreed to have three children before we were married, but our problems with Carrie ruined those plans. After I learned that my best friend had ruined those plans, all the pain and suffering seemed pointless. We had a difficult time in the years immediately following our marriage. Yes, our 14-year marriage had its happy moments, but even those were tainted by this discovery now that I know they might have been unfaithful the entire time. If Jenna hadn't been with George, maybe I could have gotten her pregnant. She might not have had such a horrible pregnancy and a challenging child, which made her lose interest in having more children. George ruined my life on our wedding day when he was with my soon-to-be wife. He now sees her at least twice a month, and I can almost hear him laughing at my ignorance the entire time. He will undoubtedly suffer the consequences. I thought as I lay there trying to fall asleep. After turning on a stupid comedy show on TV, I was able to relax and calm down, and by 11 o'clock, I was ready to sleep in preparation for a long day. I was angry once more, but I had to calm down or I wouldn't be able to go asleep. I got some great cars at great prices, met a number of dealers from the Albuquerque area, and the auction went well. I started looking around and found two dealers who had Miatas, one in black and one in red and asked if they would be open to working a trade once I knew my client's favorite color. Of course, they all said, we'll make it happen, just let me know what kind of cars you have on your lot. I needed to get into the habit of going to this auction more often. The company of other businesses in my sector was motivating me to expand my company and had temporarily taken my mind off my problems. When I met with my lawyer that afternoon, I was informed that I would lose half of my fortune and still be required to pay child support and alimony for a child who wasn't even my biological child. I decided then and there that I would not divorce her, but leave her with George's child and pay off the mortgage because she could not sell the house because my name was the only one on the deed. And if I stayed and paid the taxes and utilities, she couldn't claim abandonment and take the house. My business was already incorporated, but I felt that if I didn't take certain safeguards, it might be taken away from me. So I needed to figure out what to do with it. I should speak with my business lawyer about this. As I dragged inside my house, exhausted from a long day, I told Jenna, I'm beat. And then I said, I'm going to the bathroom and then get straight to bed before heading to my bedroom. Are you up for dinner? She called out to me. I said, no, I had a late lunch. I appreciated her asking. All my problems seemed to disappear as I stepped into the shower. I still had problems, but I was getting closer to finding solutions. After a week of stressing, I was finally able to unwind because I dozed off as soon as my head touched the pillow. I had a lot of work to do and more plans to make. So I got up early, got re-energized, and headed to the office before Jenna and Carrie had even gotten out of bed. I was buried in spreadsheets, sales projections, and financials the moment my employees started to arrive. I told Paul that we had purchased 23 cars and that we would be trading them in for one from an Albuquerque dealer within the week. I told Anna not to schedule any more work for George, but to keep that information private. She gave me a puzzled look and then said, You're the boss. Thanks, Anna. You're indispensable. I called my corporate lawyer at 9 in the morning to ask him for some guidance. She might be able to pressure you into selling it for half its value, even if you've established a business. Have you thought about selling it before? No. Would it be required? It would keep the business out of her hands, he said. This business is my life. I couldn't get rid of it, he responded. I'll give you a call later this week. I need time to reflect and gather facts. I had worked so hard to build my business, so hearing the news upset me. Unlike Carrie, it's my baby. Now I was thinking to myself, I was becoming angry again. Successful businesses must be able to compartmentalize and multitask. I had to put my personal problems aside and go back to work. 
Doug was the head of the department that had confirmed George's assertions, and I had to contact him right away. Douglas Kurt Kaminsky, I have included two Miatas that might be of interest to you. There are two hues, black and crimson. Have you thought about it more? If the price is right, he replied. Which shade would you find appealing? I'll bring it here for you to review, and then we'll talk figures. I'm sure I can sell it quickly and simply if we can't agree on a price. What do you believe would be the best option? He asked a direct question. Every choice has benefits and drawbacks. Red is still a very striking color, even though it is more ephemeral than fire engine red. Despite its exquisite appearance, black may get very hot in our surroundings. I have to ask, will you keep this car in a garage while you're not using it? Yes, I can do that. Fading won't be a problem, because the red one won't get much sunlight. Unless you think black is more your style, I'd go with it. Red sounds fantastic. When will I be able to see it? Is Tuesday or Monday more convenient for you? Sure, call me when you get it in. Will do. After hanging off the phone, I called the dealer who owned the red one to arrange a trade, and he noticed one of the BMWs on my lot and thought he would sell it in the city after three months of sitting. By now George was in, a few of his cars still needed work, and since he was an independent contractor, I didn't mind if he came and went as he pleased as long as the job was done when I needed the car. He heard two of the salespeople talking about the 23 automobiles that will soon be on our lot, and he came into my office and said, Hey Kurt, when are those cars coming in from the auction? I want to make sure that I arrange my schedule so that I can finish those for you. They're being shipped down here by the auction house. I found it difficult to deal with the betrayal calmly, but he stated, it will be sometime late next week or early the following week. Okay, I'll get with Anna and have her get me on the schedule, he said. When he left, I let out a silent laugh. I did my best to stay away from Jenna during that weekend. And even though she had her phone tracker turned on, I didn't look at it because, at this point, it didn't matter to me. Having someone else's child raised by me was completely unacceptable, and all I could feel for her was disdain. I went back to the car lot on Monday, called the dealer in Albuquerque, and told him I was going to drive the BMW up to pick up the Miata. Great, he replied. We'll have a late lunch when you get here. I told Anna that I would be gone all day because it was a lovely day for a drive and asked her to hold down the fort. She answered, okay, boss, and she was vital. As I had the thought, I need to give her a raise. The ride was pleasant, as was lunch and the other owner made me feel quite welcome, as if I had found a new friend. I decided to call the other dealer and have them bring me the black one, because I needed to let loose a little, and I won't be in need of anything more than a two-seater anytime soon. And I was having a great time driving the Miata on the way back with the canopy down and the wind blowing through my hair. Jenna must have mentioned something, because when I rolled the red sports car into our driveway, both Carrie and Jenna got out to see what Jenna had seen through the glass. Why do you have this car, honey? She said sarcastically. You are aware that we require a vehicle with a rear seat for Carrie. I just picked it up for a customer from Albuquerque. I told her, I thought you both might like a ride in it. The idea was gently rejected by Jenna, who said, No, honey, I don't like small cars. Carrie, I questioned my daughter, did I motion for her to come in? She said, No, dad, being made fun of for my last name is already awful enough. She said, I don't want to be seen riding around with Polak, the used car salesman, in a way that is typical of teenagers. I was shocked, to put it lightly, and wondered what had caused this disrespect. Jenna acted as if Carrie had done nothing wrong while I looked at her. Wow, both of my female household members are now disrespecting me. Despite my knowledge that children shouldn't be best buds with their parents, her hurtful remarks clouded the dynamics of my entire family. All right, I'm going to try again. After saying, I'll be right back, I put the car in reverse and drove off. As I drove around the Silver City area, I was furious because my marriage was rapidly failing. As soon as I parked into the driveway, which was around 9.30, I hurried upstairs, jumped in the shower, and hopped into bed. I strained my eyes tight because the hallway light was shining directly into my face, and I hadn't even gotten out of the shower before Jenna climbed up and entered the room. What? We didn't fawn all over the sports car, and that hurt your feelings. You're not going to spend time with your family downstairs? You're a baby in addition to being a Polak. Where did this attitude come from? I thought it was George's voice. He's been hanging around her, and his disdain for my heritage has been affecting her. Now she's passing it on to her child. Not mine. 
but her daughter. I should really think about that. She wasn't my child, but I would probably have to be by her side. You can just leave as it seems that you and your daughter would prefer not to have the Polak around. She was making things worse with her attitude, and I was mad. Whoever it was that treated me like that would regret it deeply. Needless to say, the Kaminsky home was silent and chilly from that moment on. When I called Doug the following day, he came over to look at the Miata and was thrilled. We discussed the numbers, and he was amazed at the amazing price he was getting, $3,000 less than Kelly Blue Book. My closest friend oversees university purchasing, and we swap out 16 automobiles roughly every two years. I understand that it's not much, but would you be open to speaking with him? He finished all the required paperwork and was ready to leave when he requested. Always glad for the business, and you know I'll cut them a deal. I told him. I'll have Jim call you later this week. I only answered, thank you. My business had taken off as a result of treating people fairly and expressing my appreciation for recommendations. Hey Kurt, I believe I know how to solve your possible issue. Would you be able to come over and talk to me about it this afternoon? On Wednesday, I asked my lawyer, yes. I'm excited to get this started. The environment around my residence is becoming increasingly intolerable. I listened carefully in that meeting and felt the plan was sound. If it worked, the two weeks it would take to put it into action would be worth it. George was counting down the days until he could bill me for the work he had done on those 20-odd cars, and I would put him off just by asking. During those two weeks, I meticulously packed up everything I owned, including tools and moved them to an apartment in a nearby town. I cleaned out my dressers and closet while Jenna and Carrie were out of town, and I used that final weekend to do some yard work. For Jenna, having her laundry done during the week was the key to a free weekend, so it worked out well for me because she wouldn't see me throwing out all my clothes. Which brings to mind that I told Jenna, I'm going, on Monday evening. My Polak heritage and my work as a used car salesman had once again been the reason for her contempt and animosity, and my use of the name was an escalation, a word she hated, and I told her I was going when she lost her anger. I used to stay at least one night in a motel when I was really angry. It was standard procedure for me to have weekly meetings, so when I pulled into the parking lot early on Tuesday morning after the explosion, I instructed my co-workers to assemble in the conference room as they were entering and shut the door behind them. Our meeting got underway. We are no longer using George for any work here. If he asks you, tell him that we have decided to take a different route. And that's that. Good morning, everyone. The cars I bought a few weeks ago arrived yesterday afternoon. They've all been inspected and prepared, so they're ready to be sold. Your generosity and kindness have been so overwhelming that I am finding it difficult to face the future because of you. I stopped and wiped away the tears that were streaming down my face before saying, I have sold the business. They looked at me in surprise, but they assured me that their jobs would not change. Despite their initial surprise, the group immediately started complimenting Anna, who was clearly deserving of their respect. With the exception of Anna, who will be delegating some of my responsibilities and receiving a raise to go along with it, she remarked. Anna, after the meeting, please come and talk to me, and we'll go over a few things. I'll still be participating but just in a consulting capacity. Here and there, I might even close a deal. They were all relieved to learn that I will be present, even if only occasionally, and I most definitely don't want to take any of your business. George, who had attended most of his meetings before, was shocked to learn that he was left out this time and stayed at the doorway as we left the room after the meeting. Because this was an employee meeting, and you are not an employee, I said, raising my voice. It looks like the cars are finally here. I'll get to work on them right away, he declared after a moment's hesitation. No, they've already undergone a comprehensive inspection and been prepared for sale. They won't require any treatment, I firmly retorted. But I check out all your cars, Kurt, he said, turning to face me incredulously. What's happening? I've discovered that sometimes less is more. So instead of losing it, I told him gently, George, I've sold the business and the new owner wants to go in a different direction. Set that one aside for when the moment is perfect. It's unbelievable that you sold the company, he yelled that IT was hilarious. Now what should I do? He was the focus of attention, of course. He had been formally informed of his work status. That was my answer. Well, I said, there wasn't much you accomplished in the past two weeks, but now you may collect your payment. 
Anna had hardly used him at all, and he had been sitting around before the delivery of the 23 cars because he thought he would be busy once they arrived. Boy, was he wrong. I didn't understand him at all, and the only reason I didn't tell him was because he was a cunning jerk. While we were together, I asked Anna to respect the privacy of our communication. Sure, Kurt. You know I would never say anything you didn't want me to. I felt at ease. All right, so this is the deal. I have established businesses and incorporated them in Nevada. This vehicle lot is being purchased by one company, and the other company is being purchased by another. For both businesses, I am the only shareholder. I'm making sure Jenna doesn't get the business because I'll be divorcing her eventually. Why? She asked. Jenna doesn't know, but I'm leaving my house already. She's been seeing George. In fact, I don't think Carrie is my child, but rather George's. Neither Jenna nor George are aware of this, but they will soon discover it. I'm not getting a divorce, but I will continue to pay the taxes and expenses on our property, so she can't say I abandoned her and took everything I owned. In the event that she files for divorce on the grounds of irreconcilable differences, I have arranged for the company to be bought out twice so that they can look into the matter and prevent her from taking the firm with her. By the time she really gets around to finalizing a divorce, the money from the sale will be gone, and I will be making virtually nothing from consulting and a few sales commissions. I'm available to call if you have any questions, but know that I have total faith in you and your judgment, Anna, and you can manage the day-to-day -day operations just fine. She looked like she was about to pull the trigger when she heard about the new ownership, but her expression brightened again when Jenna and George were mentioned. I admired this woman. She was an inspiration to me. I continued, saying, I'll leave your hair when you finish this last assignment. Please order fresh letterhead and a new sign for me. The company is getting a new name. Jenna and George will become even more certain that the company has been sold to someone else as a result. The new name of the company will be Bezradni Autoda. I wrote it out for her so she could understand her. She looked at me with a curious expression, and I said, I'll tell you why I chose that name someday. Let's just say that it tells the entire tale. Despite her confusion, she trusted me and followed my instructions. So I left, saying goodbye to everyone along the way, and got into my Audi and drove up the road to Albuquerque. At two hours into my drive, I got a phone call, and it was Jenna, according to caller ID. I didn't think she would call until tonight, because that was the way it had always been whenever I had left. And then I'd come back after a day or two, and we'd talk on the phone, and after a short period of change, we'd go back to our old selves, and then there would be another explosion, and the process would start over. I decided to answer the phone, expecting to hear her spout her latest load of bullshit. I said, hello, into the hands-free microphone that was mounted in the car. She hesitated a little, and then, Kurt, what's going on? Nothing, just driving to Albuquerque. What's the reason for driving there? She asked. I said without feeling. To pick up a car. So, what I heard must be wrong then, she replied. You should certainly call your sweetheart and inquire about her marriage, as George apparently got in touch with her. My answer was, I don't know. What have you heard? George called me and said you sold the business. Why would he call you? I asked, putting her on the spot. Instead of her, he's your best friend, she remarked after gathering herself. He questioned whether I was aware of what was happening. I was simply a joke to him. Poor Polak doesn't know what his wife is doing behind his back. You're hilarious, best friend. I sold the business because it seems like my family was embarrassed that I was a used car salesman, I told Jenna. At least you are no longer burdened with that embarrassment. Well, we need to have discussed that first. She must have been worried about our ability to pay for housing, she said. I own the business. I did so before we were married, and I am free to sell it at any time. I only hope the new owner treats my ex-employees fairly. So, did you receive a fair price for it? Raised her worries about how it would affect her standard of living. I didn't care about that. All I knew was that I needed a new job. After taking a few weeks off to unwind, I'll start looking around. But what about the mortgage? She asked. Well, I used the proceeds to pay off the house, so that's out of the way. The only things left to pay are the utilities and taxes. How about the food? But gas? Is insurance a possibility? She talked almost frantically. My complete indifference for their existence suggests that I am a naive Polak. Would you be willing to work extra hours at your current job? When will you be going back home? 
Her nervousness was evident as she inquired. The moment had now arrived for me to firmly state, I'm not. What the devil? I told you the other night that I was leaving. I'm not coming back because of your warning. I'll find a way to pay all the bills so the lights will stay on. I could sense the desperation in her voice as she said, Kurt, that is impossible. You must return. I replied in a deadpan tone. No, I really don't. She cried and said, Kurt, please don't do this. To which I said, I already have. What about your young daughter? She asked in an effort to evoke strong feelings in me. Are you talking about Carrie? The girl who goes by her maiden name and is ashamed that her father used to sell used cars? The girl is merely acting like she's older, Kurt. You must not allow that to harm you. To be honest, it no longer has much of an impact. In order to spare you from feeling degraded by me, I will not be coming back. Knowing that she was likely trying to call me again and would be upset that I wasn't returning her call, I let her think about it for a while before hanging up and turning off my phone. After my phone call, I tried to relax by thinking about the beautiful drive to Albuquerque, and I guess that she then called her partner to get further information and to let him know what I had said. When I finally got there, I turned on my phone once more and saw five messages, which I listened to, three from Jenna, one from George, and one from Anna, whom I immediately called. I apologize, Anna. I didn't have my phone on. I wasn't interested in the calls I was getting. Oh, I see. George and your wife have been calling me to see how you're doing. I informed them that since they no longer own the place, they no longer needed to check in. I hope that was all right. If they cause you excessive distress, inform them that you will be contacting the authorities regarding their harassing phone calls, I said. It may seem like you have no one to turn to for support, but trust me when I say that you do, Kurt. You may always count on us as your family, she said. Inna, you were exactly right. I truly appreciate that. I hope your husband appreciates his wonderful fortune. Believe me, he knows. He keeps me updated. You have to hold on to that at all times. Never let go and hold each other close to your heart. Don't intend to, she had said. I hung up, debating whether to confront the cunning jerk or my cheating wife. When I got out of the Audi, the owner was waiting for me in the car lot office. I've got the Audi I told you about, he said. Would you like to look into the possibilities of a trade? Let's come take a look. I could sell this in a week. He turned to me and said, Would you still like to proceed with the trade? I was amazed with the condition of the vehicle, both inside and out and under the hood. I feel like I'm winning in this situation. You can repay the kindness at a later time. I'm not here to make money. I want to buy a sports car. 30 minutes later, I was back on the road, enjoying the ride with the top down, and all I had to do was figure out where to go. North seemed great so I went to Santa Fe. I traveled through North New Mexico, Arizona, Southern Utah, and Colorado in the two weeks that followed, staying close in case Anna needed me back, and after a few phone conversations, I decided to go west after I realized she had everything under control. I listened, but I didn't care, and I laughed when I got the call about the credit card being canceled, and I had to laugh even harder when George called and told me that I was a bad person for just leaving Jenna and Carrie. I kept getting calls, and they gradually went from irritated to apologetic to a complete meltdown. I did receive a call from my lawyer once. Jenna threatened to sue me for abandonment unless I returned her call. So I did. Hello, this is Kurt. My wife has been threatening you over the phone then. I cried out. However, I wouldn't worry about it, so don't worry. It's challenging for her to demonstrate that because you're still paying the house's utilities. I can do you one better. I told her. I've got a recording of me telling her I'm leaving and her telling me to not come back. Whoa, that's amazing. Send me a copy of that, please. I will give it to her lawyer if she causes me any trouble, he said, and let her lawyer try to bring it up. Thanks, I'll call you in a week to see what's going on. People stared and I even got a few flashes from tired, middle-aged females, but I didn't pursue it because, hey, I was still married. I had a lot of fun driving around the Southwest in my little Miata, which wasn't exactly a comfort plus, but it was a lot of fun. I left Reno and went down the shoreline in many different routes, passing via Yosemite National Park, San Diego, Death Valley, Las Vegas, and finally Phoenix before heading on to Lake Tahoe, the coast, Napa Valley, and Highway 1. I would stop at car dealerships, talk to the owners, and slap them across the face because I was taking my time and some of them were envious that someone in his late 30s could get up and ride around. My entire team, including some new ones, 
Welcome me back to Silver City after three months and 8,000 miles at Bezradny Auto. When I walked into Anna's office, which had been my old office, she looked up, her smile widened, and she got up from her chair to give me a bare embrace. Following a lengthy discussion, I suggested that we have lunch and drinks at Wrangler's. Can you close the store at 5 colon 0 0? It was 3 o'clock at the time, and I had a few errands to run. I will not change my views under any circumstances. All crew members will be present. When I said them farewell and stated I would see them all in two hours, they appeared to be in a good mood. While traveling, I met with my lawyer, who told me that Jenna had tried to take all of my assets by way of desertion, but that he had managed to stop her, and we talked about what I should do next. We had a great lunch, and it was good to see everyone again when I met up with the crew at Wrangler's at 5 o'clock. After an hour and a half, they began to depart to return home, leaving me alone with Anna, who gave me a knowing look and said, You know, Kurt, you might think you're helpless, vulnerable, and clueless, but you're wrong. You simply had faith in the people you cared about, she said. Although it took me some time to understand, you had said that the new name encapsulated everything. It kept poking me until I figured it out. Jokes about the Polak will never capture your true self, no matter how many you tell. The jokes are disrespectful to your culture and to you. Thank you so much, Anna. The reason I'm coming back is because of you. I had to see how things were going for you after I departed. I'm happy to say that you made a completely new pair of shoes instead of simply stepping into mine. With appreciation, she said, I had a great mentor. I went back to my stuffy apartment, which had not been visited in three months, and I opened the windows to let the cool evening air fill the rooms. And after our embrace, she went back to her husband, who was very lucky. I grabbed a beer and sat on the terrace that looked out over the pool where a family was playing and some people were swimming, and I thought about Jenna and me and how everything we had planned and wanted had fallen apart since we were married. The wall clock said 8.30, so I figured it was time for the showdown. I got out of bed, got into my Miata, and drove to my house, which is still the one I purchased before Jenna and I were married because the deed only had my name on it. I was disappointed when I arrived at the house since the yard was in poor condition and the landscaping looked like it had been neglected. Since the lights were on, I thought Jenna was home, so I went to the door and knocked. A minute later, Carrie came out, her face displaying anger as she said, Dad, do you have your mother home? E. Carilla. She shook her head and finally managed to utter the word, um, Now what? Jenna shouted in a very agitated and nervous voice from the kitchen. Her loud response was, Dad, while she continued to look directly at me. Jenna saw me as she turned the corner and exclaimed, Where have you been? Traveling was my cool-headed answer to her shouting. Just then, George came out of the bedroom, still in his boxers. Oh, he replied, Mom, Dad, and the child are all here. I assume George has moved in to take my place. After all, it is rightfully his. Jenna looked at me with a puzzled look on her face. Carrie's voice was filled with wrath as she said, He lost his apartment after you fired him, and Mom needed a guy to help pay the bills and take care of the other duties around here, since you just left. Well, young lady, you seem to be misinformed. I had to reply, and she hated it when I corrected her. George himself stated that he was never my employee, hence I was unable to fire him. In reference to the bills, my motor insurance and all of my utilities have been automatically paid. However, what about the food and gasoline in the trunk? Jenna shouted. Did your employer fire you? It was just your mad money before, but it was enough to pay for groceries and gas while I was away. You really think you can just go back and move back in? She asked. They were obviously making out in my house, and Carrie seemed to be okay with it. No, I'll wait until you and your lover can find a place. Jenna declared. I'm not moving out of my house. Pardon me, but this is my house. The deed just has my name on it, and it was mine prior to our marriage, I said. Well, you left, so now it's mine. The law will not allow you to do that. Since I have been paying the taxes and utilities, I am still regarded as the legal owner despite my brief absence. Don't worry. I'll give you two sweethearts until the end of next month to find a good place to live. Just don't forget to bring your daughter. How come you're talking about your daughter? We are really pleased with her. I smiled and remarked. Truer words could not be spoken. Carrie and Jenna looked puzzled as I said, Your biological father is George, not me. 
I know you hate being known as a Polak, so I have good news for you, I said. There was an overwhelming silence in the room. Jenna said in a meek tone at the conclusion of the minute, What? It appears that your small, mischievous behavior on the wedding day resulted in a child. But it wasn't mine, Jenna. However, there is one improvement. You can now legally go by your biological father's last name, Carrie Carrie. I wonder if mom's insistence on the name Carrie wasn't an attempt to honor her boyfriend. Jenna turned to George, who looked as white as snow, as we caught eyes. George, I assumed you wanted to have children. It's a shame. Accept the challenge. Consider it this way. You simply need to continue doing it for four more years before attending college. They said almost the same thing. I don't believe it. I threw the DNA findings at them and said, see for yourself. After grasping it and examining it, they both fainted. Carrie, tell the lovebirds that your mom will be served divorce papers sometime next week along with an eviction notice. I turned around and walked off. During my absence, I couldn't help but wonder if she had ever been faithful to me and if the affair had continued throughout our marriage. I thought she chose me, but was that true? We met when she came in to buy a car, George was fixing one of them, and we both thought she would be interesting to date. I was really Bezradney, which means that I was naive, helpless, and vulnerable. George would laugh at me behind my back and crack jokes in Polish while I was speaking. I took a car back to the flat and got a beer or two. I knew we would have to sell the house and split the proceeds, but I assumed that as a low-income guy with someone else assuming my job, I would not be required to pay child support or alimony. So I went to see my lawyer first thing in the morning and had him start the paperwork. It would be a long time before I trusted anyone again, male or female, and the betrayal was shocking. I also liked Jenna and George. Maybe I need therapy. When I went back to work at the car lot, this time as a salesman, the divorce was already underway, and I made it plain to everyone that I was no longer in charge and that I could make ends meet with just one sale a week to pay my rent and groceries. In fact, I was pretty demanding on just one, so that at the end of the month there would be no money left over for anything but my own meager living expenses. I don't know how Jenna could afford a lawyer. Maybe he was operating on contingency. Boy, was he going to be startled. They looked into my bank accounts and found that I had spent the sale profits. They even looked into the transaction itself, but they couldn't find anything wrong. Word got around the sales department while I was away that George had been going to Anna almost daily for the first two weeks in an attempt to find work, and that Anna had no trouble telling him no each time, so he finally gave up. He was now regretting not getting his ASE certification because the only job he could find paid $13 per hour at a Valvoline quick oil change. I sincerely hope Jenna went full-time because otherwise they would be struggling to make ends meet. Since Jenna had already received the eviction notice, she would have to leave the property before it sold and closed. So I hired a real estate agent and informed her that I intended to sell the house and split the money equally between us. One night, Jenna knocked on my door, of all people. What are you looking for? I said as I opened the door and met her gaze. Kurt, would you like to have a conversation? I don't think that is a good idea. We're in litigation against each other. Just the two of us, no attorneys. Come on, Kurt. Why can't we just sit down and talk civilly? I stepped up and offered that we go to Denny's so that there would be witnesses since I didn't trust her enough to be with her alone. We sat in a Denny's table for a few minutes exchanging pleasantries until I said, Why, Jenna? I suppose the simple explanation is that I had feelings for both of you and was unable to decide. She continued glancing at me. So, were we both dating at the same moment? Yes, but George cautioned me not to tell you anything for fear it would harm our professional and personal relationship, she said, casting a gaze down at the table. I don't understand why you agreed to be my wife when I asked. Because I loved you. Does George still play a part? I asked the query. I had similar feelings about him, but I also knew he wasn't a good fit for a wife. When you inquired, we talked about it and ended our relationship. All I wanted to worry about was getting ready for our wedding. So, on our wedding day, you letting him sleep with you is saying, I'm marrying him, but you're still my man. She began to sob more intensely as she declared, It wasn't like that. So, Jenna, what was it? She hesitated before speaking, then said, I didn't want to lose him, and he didn't want to lose me. Anyway, you now have each other and your child. You did a fantastic job with her name. By the way, I didn't even realize it until I had a few months to think about it while traveling. She then turned to face me and said, Kurt, 
I wanted to come talk to you tonight to tell you that I still love you. I didn't know Carrie wasn't yours. Really, I didn't. Jenna, that's very kind of you to say, but I don't think you truly get love. It goes without saying that you cannot comprehend the extent of my affection for you. I regret to inform you that I no longer adore you as much as I once did. I did it with all of my heart, but now I just hate you. Then she looked up at me and realized that we were no longer connected. There was no us left in our relationship. Have you ever stopped? I needed to ask again. There were sluggish times, but on average we met twice a month. We never really stopped, she said after a brief pause, possibly understanding that it was useless to lie. I was relieved that she told me the truth, even if I had hoped for a different answer. One more thing, please. Why you started treating me so badly about a year ago is beyond me. There was a total change in your attitude. The outside was blatantly disrespectful. She remarked, her cheeks flushed and her face a little irate. George started trying to get me to do a threesome, not with you, adding, I doubt I could have done it without you, but we just couldn't find a way to work together. I hated you for doing something I knew you would never do. Yet he persevered. I know it seems strange, but I despised you because you weren't the type to let my two men adore me simultaneously. Well, have you ever done that? I asked the query. No, I thought about it, but then you left and my whole world came crashing down. You can do it now that you know I won't mind. Your behavior no longer bothers me. I paid the bill and we parted ways after realizing that we had both had enough of each other's conversation. Four months later, we were both there before a judge, George included, who announced our divorce. Jenna said, can we go get a drink, just for fun, while we're leaving the courthouse? Sure. I said, having already forgiven them. This will be the last time I have to spend time with them. I said, from now on, they may spend time alone together. Allow the pigs to live in their dung. They are worthy of one another. Jenna will have to adjust to a worse quality of life. Ha ha. Perhaps there was still animosity. The bartender shouted, Hey, we don't serve your kind in here. As we entered the bar, and I couldn't help but think of all the jokes that could be made about our entrance at Wranglers that it all began with the statement, a Polak, a cheating wife, and a backstabbing friend enter a pub. Okay, the Polak is welcome, but the health department won't allow us to have openly visible cheaters and backstabbers in a restaurant. As the backstabber and cheater exchange glances, the bartender responds, Hey, you can't deny service just because he's a Polak. I once negotiated with Gus for a vintage car that someone had traded in, and he has been treating me like a king or queen ever since. He takes meticulous care of his 1972 Grand Torino, cleaning and polishing everything from the rear taillights to the front chrome. I am a Polak, but I am a well-respected one.